Tonight we'll be playing Call of Cthulhu, a horror-themed role-playing game inspired by the works of H.P. Lovecraft. I'm Alex, and I'll be your dungeon master, or rather, the keeper of arcane lore. Joining me is Sean, who'll be playing Emmett McFadden, aka Hunch, an Irish thief. We also have Brent, who's playing Dr. Desmond Pierce, a psychologist at the Miskatonic University. Tonight's story will take place in New York City in the year 1920. All that follows is 100% improvised, so sit back and relax, because it's going to get spooky. The fat man of man. Welcome to De Vermis Mysterious, the podcast from Yuggoth. Brought to you by the sons of Sana. (laughs) 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 It is a cold November morning, and you, Dr. Desmond Pierce, sit in your office. On the door, it says... Dr. Desmond Pierce, with the esteemed written below in chalk. Inside, there is a conversation happening. Oh, Mr. Pierce, I've been having these, these strange dreams. Can you please explain further what these dreams entail? Well, uh, I suppose it's just the one dream repeated night after night. I... I see... I see you, Mr. Pierce. Dr. Pierce, sorry. I see you in my dreams. Mm. You see me? Yes, on a dark night. uh, Walking down the street. Long shadow cast in the the street lights. But you're not alone, Mr. Pierce. Sorry, sorry, Dr. Pierce. There's another man who walks beside you. He looks like a, a bit of a ruffian, to be honest. I don't know why he'd be associating with you. But I see both of you walking down the street and I am looking down from my apartment looking down from the window sometimes the window is open and the cold breeze lashes at me in my pajamas all right uh, how vivid are these dreams oh I cannot describe it it's uh... Is it a regular cycle? Does it happen every night, or is it on a weekly basis? Well... Look, look, why don't you come over here and take a lay down on my leather couch? Okay, okay. I'll grab my notebook, and uh, we can go through the necessary procedures to see what exactly is hidden in your subconscious. Yes, um... Well, Charlotte, you notice that she's quite... Well dressed, obviously upper class. Looking quite distraught, big bags under her eyes. She leans back on the couch. Well, I'm looking here at your reports on a longitudinal study that we've done over the past couple of months on your uh, on your personality, and you've scored very high on the neuroticism. You know, you you are fearful, maybe. Envious, moody at times. Is this, uh, would this be your sort of view of yourself? She looks offended for a moment, but then she thinks better of it. Well, I suppose if that's your professional opinion. uh... Well, we've just, many studies have been done, and it seems that people that score higher on neuroticism have uh, more vivid, more 
disturbing views as it can affect your emotion and everything that's happening around you. Your subconscious does take this in and it's stored, you know, in your mind and this is sort of expressed on the envy, empty canvas that is, you know, your subconscious but when you dream this is expressed in that in that way or the fears and you know the envy and everything that gets expressed during the conscious he starts to sort of break down and sort of start to whimper to herself well doctor i don't know how my subconscious could be so disturbed for when you pass down on that dark street after you follows a man, a despicable figure, dressed in black. This is very disturbing. Um, you look uh, a little distressed. Are you sure you can continue? <laughs> we can make another appointment, but I would love to continue. I feel like there's a he lot to do. He just follows you down the street, and, and, I see, and I see you, and I know... I know, Doctor, that it's the last time I'll ever see you, but when I wake up in sweats, well, I don't know quite what's been getting into me, Doctor. Well, I have some sort of hypothesis. Um, tell me, did you have a strong father-like figure in your, uh, in your life? Well... Uh, I suppose we've talked about my father before and uh well you know he wasn't such a great man hmm well I feel that you're you know to fill this void you have to seek out another father figure in life you know and maybe you view me as that figure and that's what's leading you to these obsessive dreams truth be told Doctor, I am worried for you. I'm worried for... for no reason, really, but it's just this dream. It haunts me. I think that fundamentally it is damage done in your developmental phases that has led you to these dreams, because you've had no figure to look up to until now. Perhaps you're right, but how can I fix that? Well, you must find your own path in life, and you must fulfill your own needs and acquire this self-actualization. Let's cut over to our friend Emmett McFadden. You are in your hovel, as you described it. Can you describe to me what sort of furnishings this place has? Well, the wood, the wood seems to be deteriorating quite a bit. Small, somewhat comfortable couch once you get used to it. Small little rooms, just enough for a bed and maybe a small set of drawers and not much else. Small fireplace. And is your flatmate living with you at the moment? Is he in the room? No, look, he's out on one of his little trips to the local bar. Most likely gambling and whoring. Lucky's quite the... Well, let's just say he loves to indulge in that hedonism. Okay. You hear a knock at the door. Hey! McFadden, open up! Who is it? It's me. Knock again. I open the door. You see a tall, tall man uh, with a shaven head and an obligatory scar running down the left side of his face. Got any whiskey in here? <laughs> Got any whiskey in the McFadden residence, friend? <laughs> aye, aye, aye. <laughs> As I grab the bottle of whiskey and grab two glasses, I stop and look at him. So, what do I owe the pleasure? Well, why don't we have a drink first and a bit of chit-chat, a bit of small talk, and then we'll get down to business. He looks very agitated. 
Right there, friend. Man after my own heart. Sit down. Take a seat by the fire. Enjoy yourself. You, uh... Start drinking the whiskey. Sitting by the crackling fire, which is mostly newspapers and a few pine cones you collected. Talking of old times with this old friend, Mickey. But he seems... As I said, agitated and restless. And then after about two glasses of whiskey, the conversation drops off and falls into an awkward silence. Look, McFadden. I'm sure you can tell I didn't just come here to drink whiskey. Well, the two empty glasses say otherwise there, friend. <laughs> but go on, go on. The other night, when we went into that place, that rich man's house, Boston. downtown, we took an awful lot of shit from that place, but there was one thing that caught my eye just as you were sliding it into your pocket. The statue. Oh, that weird old little thing. I felt like that thing were looking at me, but probably some collector twat or something. You know how these rich people get when they get bored. Well, McFadden, what about we we do a trade, huh? You give me the statue and, uh, well, what do you want for it? Five dollars? I, I like your friend. I'll invite you into me house. I'll have a drink with you. But you know the rules. You know what Big Daddy always says about it. What you take is yours. You only give what you have to give and what you took to give. But anything you take for your own spoils, it's your own. Come on, friend. You can't do this to me. He looks down and puts his face in his hands. Well then... Old friend, I uh, guess I'll just have to take it back. He stands up. What the fuck do you think you're doing? And swings at your Irish face. And he rolls an 82. Do you want to give me a dodge roll? Can I spend two luck? 42 to 40. Nope. Can't spend luck on combat rolls. <laughs> True. He hits you, um, just a glancing blow, sort of just scrapes the tip of your nose. He didn't roll very well himself. <gasps> Oi! Mate! What are you doing? You can see he's got this look on his face, like something you've never seen before. It doesn't look like Mickey anymore, it looks like someone else. Um, I'm going to grab one of the empty, whipty, um, empty whiskey glasses and smash it against his jaw. Okay, can you give me a brawl roll? 52 to 70 success. Okay, you smash it against his jaw. <laughs> he falls to the ground and sort of clutches his jaw and you can see blood starting to come out. You've actually hit him quite hard. Come on, mate. You can't come into me house and fuck around like that. Just give it to me, friend. Just give it to me. I'll give you another whiskey glass in the face, you keep asking, get the fuck out of me house, and you bet your ass I'm telling Big Daddy about this one. I don't want to see you around these parts, you understand? Look, look, he stands up. Uh, okay, look, I'll, I'll forget about it, forget about it, just don't tell Daddy. I won't, but if I see your face again, bad shit's coming your way, mate. Bad shit. Fuck you, McFadden. Get the fuck out of me house, you bastard. He turns, leaves, and he slams the door on his exit so hard that it actually falls off its hinges. Motherfucker! We just got that done the other day! Look, he's gonna blame me for fuck's sake. Fucking Mickey. Well, over in Arkham, Dr. Desmond Pierce... His plans for the weekends are visiting the New York Book Fair. Every ten years or so, at the New York Book Fair, 
vendors from across the land come and congregate in this great city. They bring books in a thousand different languages. Some of these can be interesting, some can be very rare, some can be dangerous. Mr. Pierce, what kind of books will you be looking for tomorrow at the fair? I'm going to be looking for any type of books that have any odd archaic inscriptions and anything that's similar to any of the writings left by Professor Wingate Peasley. Peasley. He was my mentor and I did my I did my PhD under him. <clears throat> Unfortunately I had to talk at his funeral. He was comatose six days before his death, and all he had left me were rambling writings in his in his notebook. All in blood. Mr. Peasley wandered the globe aimlessly for, for weeks before they found him. He had somehow adopted six different languages and knew about, knew about planets outside the very existence that beyond the moon, beyond anything received by man so far and he spoke of vistas of dark realms inside of his mind and this disturbed me and my future studies have led to see if there's any fundamental metaphysical data that can be found on what exactly happened to this man that I looked up to you take the night train from Arkham up to New York. Where would you like to stay the night? Just a nice one room with a desk and a bed. And okay. So. Just a nice little hotel. Nothing too uh, fancy. Can you give me a luck roll? Ooh, cr high success. Okay. Three versus forty. So, all of the uh, rooms have been booked out, even though you had a reservation, and they've actually put you in the presidential suite at the top of the building. Hmm. Are there any books? Oh, a few things, but nothing of interest, really. Hmm. I'm more a man of modesty. This is way too lavish than what I'm used to. <laughs> so, next day, it's about oh, midday, and the book fair is in full swing. Thousands of different little sort of tents have been put up around. What about Central Park? We can have it in Central Park. Central Park is overflowing with small tents and they're all selling books, as I said, in thousands of different languages. Now, McFadden, on your midday jog through Central Park, today the park has been overwhelmed by these guys selling books. I don't know, can you even read? Can read a couple words, but for some of the titles of these things, big bloody jumbles of words. Sometimes I think people just, you know, it's like a soup of letters and they just throw it together and say, aye, that sounds fancy. And then put it on the front of their book. Now, as you're walking down <clears throat> the street, Dr. Pierce, you notice this sort of ruffian walking in front of you. Seems to be eyeing up a few of the books, flicking through a few pages, but it doesn't look like he really knows. 
what he's looking at. Something, uh, about him. Hmm, maybe sends a shiver down your spine. It says something about him, and you think back ah. to yesterday when um, Charlotte was talking about uh, a ruffian, perhaps? No, it could not be. It was just a, mm. just a dream. Now, you see McFadden... Well, you see this ruffian turn around a corner and you track him with your eyes. You see him enter a black tent, black velvet. It is one of the few sort of tents set up um, which is fully closed off. Mm. Black tent. Reminds me of the dreams that Peasley described before he passed away. Is this like a dark kind of rundown tent or? Uh, actually, it looks not too rundown, a little bit lavish. Um, doesn't have a sign out the front, and people seem to be walking past it and just completely ignoring it. Mm. I'm going to get any answers. To the mystifying questions left to me by my mentor. It's definitely in that. Black tent. <laughs> Creepy looking. <laughs> black tent. As I walk across, I cross, I, you know, browse through some books of Jung and Freud and pick up a couple of their works and uh, I make myself slow, like slowly towards the tent after browsing a little bit and not finding exactly what I was looking for. Okay. You approach the tent and uh, open up the curtain. It is dimly lit. There's a few candles in there. It seemed to be arranged, um, scattered around the room, but in a sort of symmetrical pattern, which you uh, pick up on. Now, this scruffy looking man is in there having a conversation with a small man in a black robe. In fact, he's also wearing black gloves and uh, there's a table with books on it with, of course, a black tablecloth. Uh, yes, mister. Uh, so I've got uh, uh, this book. Um, yeah, occult practices from the 17th century. I don't suppose that uh, spikes your interest, does it? For like the third time in this very conversation, friend? No, it doesn't really. Give me something precise. Give me something to do with this bloody thing, you know. No, uh, what about... Uh, uh, <clears throat> yes, what about this one? Uh, biblical demons. I'm... I'm sorry. Hey, what the fuck? I'm sorry, I didn't want to... Who the to... bloody hell are you? What is this fiasco going in here? None of your what? bloody business what? is what this fiasco is, mate. Well... It's an open bookshop, isn't it? Sir, I'm you not... look like a learned man. Can I interest you in, uh... Black... Sex cults? He opens mm. this big book and you can see it's fully illustrated. What the fuck? That's what I'm... That's... It. Can I please have a closer look? I'd like to examine this before I buy Yes, yes, you may. And I look at the front and the cover and I flick through. You can see it's written in Latin. Um, and there are lurid depictions of strange... Uh... This is exactly what Paisley was into before he... Before he died, these these bookshelves were filled to the brim before they got burned down because the university didn't want to keep such dark and disgusting books. Well then, oh, twenty dollars. That's all. Twenty dollars. I can well, see. Uh, well, just for this book alone. Well, I could chuck in a copy of the Kama Sutra, perhaps. Mm. And would you mind uh, 
chucking in one of those the books that you were trying to sell this danky old fella over here. Ick bloody excuse me, mate. Danky old fella? Yes. Who well, are you calling a danky old fella? It is it is just you know it was just an observational remark. It was nothing meant to be directed at you or character. Yeah, yeah, right, right. But it Fucking seems to me that uh, that is, you know, that's just exact what you exude. Now, I'll give you the twenty dollars, and you throw this in a book bundle for me. What do you say to that? Now, as you're sort of having this conversation with this smooth-talking occult bookseller, McFadden, you have spied a book, sort of. In the far corner of the tent. Um, it seems to be in shadow. The candlelight doesn't seem to quite reach it. And as you get closer, you squint at the, the lettering on the front. It seems to be a sort of strange old gothic writing. Can you give me Either an intelligence or a library use. Try to see me don't have. Probably just an intelligence. 88 to 60 fail. Do you have a cult? I do. You can give me an occult roll. 56 to 30 fail. Okay. Yeah, you're not quite sure what it says on the front. I... Could it be Latin or something? A bunch of bloody mumbles. That book? Huh? Oh. The man turns around. That book? Latin? He picks it up and holds it gingerly in his hands. Not quite Latin. Uh, I wouldn't know. I haven't really been able to. Well, why don't you give me a look? See if I can see what it's all about. Okay, can you give me a library use or a... A hard intelligence or um, an occult roll? I'll do an occult roll. Okay. Fail. No, you open the book and you can see it's written not in any language. It's written with English letters, but it's. uh, It doesn't. It seems to be some sort of gobbledygook, almost like a cipher. Look here, uh, book salesman. I have some uh, very smart professor that I back at the Muscatonic University, and I can have this whole thing deciphered with, for you within a week if you'd uh, just give it to me, just for the week. And uh, and I do a persuade roll. Okay, yeah, give me a persuade roll. Ninety-nine. Ninety-nine. No. I won't just give it away. Do you know what this book is, you fool? Do you not know this book? This book is... Divermus Mysterus. Divermus Mysterus? The very same. I've never heard of the works before. Is it by a famous author? I wouldn't know. The only thing I can decipher is the title. Sounds creepy enough, though, doesn't it? Why do you cling to this book? Why are you so not eager to give it up? While while these two are talking, can I use a sleight of hand to take the book away? He is clutching it, so it'll have to be... Well, give me a luck roll and we can see maybe he'll put it down on the table and maybe you'll be able to... But Success, 38 to 45. He puts it down on the table... Well, this book, uh, I don't know, there's something about it, isn't there? Yes, there's the black cover, the almost skin-like structure of its bindings. This is quite a despicable book. Can you give me a sleight of hand, please, McFadden? Eighty-three to sixty fail. Okay, now you can push it. Yep. As he sees me kind of grabbing towards it, I'm going to pretend to scratch my back, <laughs> <laughs> and then 
as he turns to talk to the doctor again, I'm going to try and take it. Okay. Give me another roll. Oh, bugger me dead. 92. What are you doing? How I dare just, you? I just wanted to get a closer look. I just wanted to get a closer look. You're talking about it a whole bunch. I Go saw the look in your eyes. You'll have to pay for it if you want it. Well, I'll definitely pay for it. I, I need this in my collection. Oh, yeah, this yeah, is yeah, very yeah, important there, to me. Maybe I need it in mine. You can't even read. Bugger you. You don't know that. What does this say? As I point to the cover of a, a book. Der Venom. Mystery Eyes. See, Look here, give I me can. the book and I can teach you a little thing or two, maybe if you want to uh, come over for a therapy session. I don't want therapy. I don't even want money. Well, what do you want for it, then? Something more valuable. And what... And what is that? Something you would be reticent to part with. You're not a very good man at articulating specificity, are you? Specifics, you mean? Precisely. Well, let's say, how about your favorite finger? Or maybe a few teeth? What about a photo of a loved one? Or your grandfather's old ring? You decide. Well, if somebody's going to give up their hand, it better be the thief. You, all you do is you use it to take away from people anyway. That's what you use your paws for. What? Who are you calling thief? I just wanted a closer look. That's what I said. You can't blame me for that shite. Bugger off. I ain't given nothing. Just a book. What let me then? I looked the man into the eyes. Do you come here every year? No. Only once in a blue moon. What is this whole get-up anyway? What are you getting at? What do you even achieve by setting up this bookstore with all these creepy tombs? Well, creepy tombs are my livelihood, okay? I studied a bachelor in creepy tomb selling. And that's what I've done ever since. Hmm. Where are you from, anyway? <laughs> he just smiles to himself. Wouldn't you like to know? Actually, no. You wouldn't like to know. Mm. I'm going to look this man up and down and look at his... Perspiration levels and uh, look into his eyes and see, into a psychology role to see if I can spot any sort of empathy. Success 56 to 80. You think that he's quite mad. You think that he's been reading too many spooky terms and he has become quite mad. But at the same time, he seems sincere and quite genuine in asking you for something dear to you, almost as if that would please him more than any sum of money to take something from you in exchange for this strange old tome. I don't have any fingers, since I need them for my practice. Well, no fingers that I would like to give you, but... Teeth, then I'll take teeth. And I pull out one of Professor Wingate Peasley's scribble books. It's got, mm, and it's got good. written in blood and has runes and archaic symbols written all over it. And it's, you know, it's a black bound, titleless, titleless book. Would you like to take a, a look through these? Maybe these could appease you. 
you know, as a trade. He flicks through the um, little notebook you've given him, uh, wild-eyed. He flips through under the light of a candle. <laughs> yes, yes. And then he opens it to one page quite near the end, uh, where you can see sort of diagram drawn in um, the doctor's blood. I think I'll take this. And he rips out the page, stuffs it into his cloak, and then gives you back the book. So it is a trade then? Take it. Take that wretched book and be gone with you. I'd like to sleight of hand um, the first book he showed me, The Occult Rituals. Okay. Success 33 to 60. Sure, put it in your inventory. Now he passes you the Vermis Mysterious. Put it in my coat pocket. Okay. And all right, this place is starting to creep me out. But before I go, I want to ask you, what exactly was in that book? I'm still sp I've sp spent m many nights pondering over it and. Surely you can give me a little insight. Well, you say this book is written by a friend of yours? Well, he was my mentor and the head of the psychology department in Missicatonic University, and all of a sudden he lost his mind and he he just had a breakdown and he started scribbling on the walls and in notebooks all these runics and he started taking very long holidays that he called it and talking in talking in all these strange tongues and when he came back he was comatose for six days before he perished well it seems that your old mentor strayed off the noble path of psychology and into something darker, more sinister. Well, I've definitely, I've definitely come to terms with that, you know. It's quite obvious, isn't it? But I mean, I know that there is, the things he said, he talked about strange vistas and cyclopean buildings of darkness and tunnels filled with Moors and I, I just want to know what happened to his mind and it's, it intrigues me so much that I cannot sleep at night and surely you have some more answers to these perplexing questions. Why did you rip out that page particularly? That diagram, I've, the geometrics of it, it's quite sickening. I took that page because, my friend, I have seen that diagram before. In another one of my books, which I sold many, many years ago, and uh, all I wanted was to rest my eyes upon it once more. You are definitely one creepy man. I don't know where you got your education, but... God, I'm definitely not telling any of my students to go to any of your lectures. <laughs> yes, they best not. He smiles to himself. All right, well, I tip my hat to both Very gentlemen. Well. I better be off. I've Enjoy. got much research to do, and I better be get back to my hotel. And my eyes are getting kind of tired. Enjoy the read, he says. What a holy jaw that fella was. You walk out of the tent, Dr. Pierce, and you start to walk through the crowds. So you go back to your hotel room. All the way as you're walking back, the sun begins to set, the rain begins to come on. And by the time you reach your hotel, you're quite drenched. It's dark, and you walk under the street lamps, alone, but the strange sensation that you're being watched. 
you open the door to the hotel, or rather the, uh, the doorman opens the door. Look around me before I go inside, as I have this eerie prickle on my back of my neck. You look over your shoulder. Doesn't seem to be anyone there. In fact, the street seems quite deserted. Um, yeah, there's a tiny slither of moon above, but the clouds have gathered around it and have obscured its glow. Uh, you head uh, up the elevator, a fancy new elevator, up to the top floor, the presidential suite. You get into some dry clothes, take off your trench coat or lab coat, um, hang it up, sit in the sofa and uh, light your pipe, begin to flick through these books, but you know, they they bore you and then you remember that, that one book, you'd almost forgotten about it actually, and the thought crosses your mind, Divermus Mysterious. Mysterious. You take it out of your satchel and begin to flick through the pages. Now, the text is, as I said, written in characters you recognize, but in strange and abstract formation. Uh, you are of the belief that it is a cipher of some sort. You know that many occult texts are written in the cipher, and it might even be something you've had to deal with in the past in your researches. I flip open the book of Paisley that's been ripped, the page that's been ripped out the same book, and I look exactly to see if I can find any matching symbols. Can I do an intelligence roll? Um, you give me role. an occult roll, okay. um, or a library use. Success. 56 versus 16? Okay. No, there doesn't seem to be any correlation. In fact, this Divermus Mysterious is quite baffling, and you can't really make out any of it, except uh, you flick to a page sort of near the end, and there is a scribbled note in the margin. It looks to be some... like a, 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 a spider or a centipede, something with many legs swallowing a worm. Now, you do remember from your Latin classes in school, Vermis, of course, means worm. The mystery of the worm. Now, Emmett McFadden. You make your way through the streets. By the time you get to your place, you're soaking wet. You walk straight through the door, which is not there anymore. It's on the ground. Fucking Mickey. And there you see... <coughs> Your housemate. Ay ay ay, it, it's Haunch, hey? Haunch, yeah. Hey, come here, come here, friend. What you been doing? Where you been? I've been sitting here for hours. What the fuck happened to the door, man? What happened to the door? Big Daddy ain't gonna pay for that and neither come we. Come on, shut up, sit down, have some whiskey. Calm down, bloody hell, just got out of the rain. Oh, pour me a glass of the single malt, will ya? Oh, why, oh, why, oh, why? So. What been happening? Lucky, I think I'm onto something. Got some holy joe at that book fair during my little morning walk, you know. I doubt. Got this, by the way. I pull out the occultist ritual book. Got this. Might have something to do with that little statue that we found at the old geezer's place down the road. I see, I see. Nice, but tell me more about this. Holy Joe that you saw. Some, I don't know, some one of them university folk came in. Just when I was in the middle of the conversation with the strange bugger who ran the tent and... Oh, bought this book, mate. 
tried to take it for myself, but failed. But ended up paying a pretty sum for it. You know what that means? I could sell it for just as much. Maybe even replace that door. Have something nice. Get a nicer bottle of whiskey. You know what I'm talking about? This fella saw him in one of them presidential suites in some high top apartment. We one of them Wist Aquatic folk, huh? Easy pickings, mate. Doesn't really seem like he's from round here. I say we hit him. Hit him soon. You in, friend? I'm always in. Let's do it. And damn it. How do you prepare for this heist? I got these blueprints. I'm telling you, I've scoped out the building. I know just about the exact floor I think your friend is on. I'm telling you, this is going to be the easiest mission we had like all month. I'm telling you, Big Daddy don't even have to know. Are you a fucking idiot, mate? Look at me, look at those blueprints. Bloody hell, Loki, you've got the wrong fucking building, mate. What do you mean? I saw, I know the building you're talking about. No, 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 it's the one further to the right on the other side of town. Oh, yeah. Sorry, huh? Sorry, huh? I, I just, uh, get out, come on. Let me plan this. All right. So, you, use that sweet tongue of yours. Talk to the security guards. I'm going to see if I can... Maybe go into a window or something and see if I can lockpick it. I'll jump in, catch the elevator up, maybe steal a suit so I look, you know, look the part and all that. Go in, bring the rope as well, make sure a sack perhaps, make sure this fucker don't speak too loudly when we catch him in his room, if he's awake. Talks too loud. Dr. Desmond Pierce. You are... Uh... Staring out the window, the open window, the wind and rain is lashing at you in your pyjamas. You're looking down at the street, dimly lit by the street lamps, and you see a man, tall, gaunt, the sort of uh, very pasty and fleshy face. Grim visage. He walks down the street and then stops just below your window. He looks up at you and the, the look on his face, the look in his eyes, it sends such a panic through you. You almost fall through the window but you manage to hold yourself and, and then you awake. You see yourself in your room. The window is shut. And you're sitting in your armchair, and you look over and see two ruffians tiptoeing about, going through your drawers, opening up your suitcase, whispering to each other. Hey, 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 hey. have you seen this guy's blazer? Have you seen this guy's suit? No oh, way, hey. we're not looking for the fucking suit, mate, we're looking for the book. Hey, what are you, hey, huh? hey, hey, why are you going through my things, eh? Hey, hey man, I'm sorry, I what thought this was our room. Hey. You bloody hey. idiot, man. All right. Hey, uh, I'm going to pull out my I gun. I reach my <laughs> shotgun. Oh. <laughs> okay, so you're both drawing guns? All right. I, I don't want any, I don't want any trouble here. I don't want yeah. any trouble. Can Neither just, do we. Well, you definitely do, because you're here looking through my, my possessions, and I do not appreciate people breaking into my house. You know what we do here in America? This is an island, all right? This isn't, this isn't Europe. This is Old America. We shoot people island, down. You daft when... cunt. Look, drop it. You first. Look here, what, what do you even want? What do you want with me? I saw you in that creepy tent, and I saw you snooping around, and you're trying to take all these books and what's your, what's your gig man we want that book the volume of mysterious you give it to me this never happened understand friend i cannot give this book belongs righteous, righteously to me i need this book it might have answers to my to my mentor's death righteously by what by the fact that I must honor this man's death for what he's left behind, and I must find out the truth to his despair and death. Hey, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait one minute. Hey, 
Hey, hunch, hunch. Wait a minute. Who your master? Who's this guy you talking about? Professor Wingate Paisley. He was my mentor, the head of the psychology department in Mesocatonic University. He went mad and then he died in hospital after a six-day coma. Now, Dr. Pierce, as you're speaking to Lucky, uh, you notice something strange. You see what appears to be a worm crawling out from underneath his right eyeball. He crawls out of his eyeball, it slides over his nose and then scuttles back into the other eyeball. Lucky doesn't seem to have noticed. I sort of turned my gun towards Lucky. Hey, hey, whoa, all I asked was a question. All I asked was a question, man. Hey, what, what, what's going on with your friend, man? What? what? Lucky begins to feel very strange. I've never, I've never, that can't have come from his brain, that's, my studies of anthropology, I've never seen anything like that, what is going on? And I sort of start shaking. Hey mate. All, all, all my studies, studies of anthropology and human, human biology, I've never seen anything that hard. Is, is that some sort of parasite you're car carrying from Ireland? Get out, man, you're sick. I've no what? time for sick people. I don't need to be sick. I've got lots of study and research to hey, do. Hey, hey, shut up. Just shut, shut up, man. Shut up. Shut, shut the fuck up, okay? <laughs> Wait, I don't feel bad, right, you know? You feel like, Lucky, you feel like you're going to throw up. <coughs> Look, man. No, no, I don't. I don't you're you're I, definitely up, sick. Uh, you're uh, infected. <coughs> I don't need to be a psychologist to see that. Somebody, please. I, I, I reach for the phone and I, I start to dial up. Before you the do, ambulance. can you make me a sanity roll as Lucky yeah. begins to chunder about two gallons of live wriggling worms out of his. They start to pour out of his nose and then out of his eyes and big fattened worms slither out of his ears <laughs> and then they seem to emerge from within his clothes and before your very eyes you can see his whole body is immersed in these writhing brown worms. <laughs>